Hello, my name is Trisha Johnson, and I'm privileged to be able to speak to you from my home today. I purposely chose this lesson, which is Defeating Discouragement, Lesson 5, because I wanted to learn along with you what God did to help Elijah when he was so discouraged. We'll spend our time together looking at just the first 18 verses of 1 Kings 19. But let's begin by praying together. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are so consistently patient with each of us in all of our circumstances and our deepest feelings. You listen to us, you see each one of us, and you understand our hearts and our attitudes. Please open your word for us now and help us see you more clearly. In your name, amen. Just as a little review, two weeks ago, uh, Sue helped us take a close look at the remarkable faith showed by Elijah to call for a showdown between the power of the false god of Baal and the power of the one true God. You're probably familiar with some similar examples of this kind of contest of power. For example, Moses and the plagues in Egypt in Exodus chapters 7 through 11. If you remember, the Pharaoh's sorcerers could mimic three of the miracles and plagues at the beginning. The shepherd's staff turning into a snake, rivers and water all turning into blood and frogs everywhere. But the remaining eight plagues only God could do. Another familiar example is from the book of Daniel, chapter 3, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are told if they don't worship the golden statue of the king, they'll be burned in a furnace. And I just love their response. This is what the scripture says. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue you've set up. Now, as you know, unlike Pharaoh, who his heart remains hard, this king ends up acknowledging in this, uh, this verse, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any God except their own. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. This is out of the mouth of a pagan king. Now this kind of demonstration or showdown has also been called a power encounter by some scholars, Bible scholars and missionaries. Today we're probably more familiar with a related term which is spiritual warfare. The point is for God to powerfully demonstrate his power in contrast to powerless pagan gods. Now Elijah shows enormous faith because as Sue mentioned uh, two weeks ago, he was summoned, he had summoned a huge audience of Israelites and over 450 prophets of Baal, as well as King Ahab himself. And Elijah says this in chapter 18, verses 38 and 39. This is his prayer. O oh Lord, answer me, answer me, so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. And immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven, burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Now, given this amazing demonstration of God's power, I've always felt baffled by how Elijah, the one who helps orchestrate what is considered one of the most <clears throat> remarkable examples of a, power, of a power encounter in the Old Testament, 
ends up running away in fear at Jezebel's threatening words. Maybe you felt baffled too. <clears throat> Let's take a deeper look. I'm going to read 1 Kings verses 1 through 9. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. And here's the surprise. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank, and he lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up, ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai in the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. That's the end of verse 9. Now Elijah somehow seems to change in these few short verses from being a powerful, faith-filled prophet to feeling fearful, discouraged, fed up, powerless, hopeless, no better than my ancestors. He was depressed, even suicidal, like you might recall Jonah was, who in chapter 4, verse 3, said to God, Kill me now! There's no point in living. What is God's response? He sends an angel to wake Elijah two times from his much-needed much needed sleep and see that he eats some fresh baked bread and water to sustain him. The second time, the angel tells him he needs to gather enough strength from his food for a 40-day trek to Mount Sinai. It was evidently a quarter of that time, but uh, I don't know whether he wandered a little bit in the wilderness, but 40 days has some biblical significance, so that's why it's a 40-day trek. We see from this that God knows Elijah is physically and emotionally spent. In a word, he's exhausted. You'll note that God doesn't criticize or reject Elijah for his fear and depression. Instead, he feeds him, gives him time for his body to rest. Now, I've got a story I've got to share with you. Many of you know that I was faced with a diagnosis of breast cancer last January. I was shocked, sad, overwhelmed at what lay ahead for me with a mastectomy and months of chemo and radiation looming ahead of me. And when I shared this news that week with my three sisters in our weekly Zoom prayer call, they prayed for me. One of them said she felt God had impressed her with a picture of Jesus holding me as he sat in the boat in the storm. That really encouraged me. And a few days later, I shared this with two good friends, and one of them told me, I, I shared this diagnosis, I didn't share the Jesus in the boat thing, with two good friends, and one of them told me, I want you to know that I'm just picturing Jesus holding you safe in a boat in the middle of the storm. I told her, this is amazing because my sisters had just shared this a couple days earlier. And so when I got home later that day, I was cooking in the kitchen and I told my husband, Todd, who was now working at his home desk about these two mentions of Jesus keeping me safe in the boat during the storm. And he said, you need to come here right now. I thought, oh, 
oh, well, I guess he didn't hear me or he has something else he wants me to see. But when I stepped around the corner, he had across his big computer screen this beautiful painting. Now, Todd says that he had prayerfully chosen this picture three weeks earlier as his new screensaver for the year 2022. We were just stunned by the coincidence and knew this was from God. And you know, in the next few weeks and then months, I've now heard or read this same theme of Jesus in the boat with me, reminder, 11 times. Once it was a song playing while I had my MRI, twice in random Bible apps on my phone, three times in sermons, and once in a children's sermon, twice in a prayer devotional that Todd and I read together before bed, and then a few months of silence. Then just last month, I read a devotional that repeated this theme of Jesus in the boat with me. Little did I know that this was just two days before I ended up in the ER for 13 hours with a very scary throat constriction and very, very painful, shallow breathing. They thought it was a heart attack. It turned out to be something called pericarditis brought on by radiation and chemo. And I'm now taking pills for that. The Lord's gentle reminders and reassurance have completely convinced me that he cares about all that we're going through. So when I think of Elijah being fed by an angel of God, I know that these Jesus in the boat reminders to me have been the way God has fed me, comforted me, and reassured me. I hope that's an encouragement to you. Now let's see what happens in this next section I could call earthquake, wind, and fire. Just kidding. So I'm going to read 1 Kings 19 verses 10 through 14. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he's in the cave on Mount Sinai. And the Lord says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. So God says, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in a cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said again, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, Go back the same way you came, and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphath, from the town of Abel Meholah to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu and those who escape from Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. Now, let's take a look at these things. Let's look at God's question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, Elijah had many days and nights to formulate his thoughts, but when, he gives, when God gives him a chance to speak, 
It's nothing like his prayer on, uh, on Mount Carmel. Last week, Sharon shared four aspects of Elijah's prayer. Number one, you are my God. Number two, you are, I am your servant. Number three, answer me, Lord. And number four, so the people will know you are God. But Elijah instead gives this self-righteous response. In contrast to God-focused prayer on Mount Carmel, this is more like a string of I statements. And this is how one commentator put it. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. Elijah was pro- protesting to God. I have faithfully served you and now look at the danger I'm in. To Elijah and many servants of God since, it seemed unfair that a faithful servant of God should be made to suffer. His next statement, I alone am left. Well, this wasn't accurate, but it's how Elijah felt. Um, Even back at Mount Carmel, uh, Elijah had said, I alone am left as a prophet of the Lord. And this shows us that discouraging times make God's servants feel more isolated and alone than they are. And this is the third point of the commentator. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. But what does God do? He gives Elijah a second chance. He says, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And the Lord passes by in a windstorm complete with rocks flying loose, but God isn't in it. An earthquake, but God isn't in it. Fire, but God isn't in it. And a gentle whisper, because it doesn't say God isn't in it. This kind of implies that it's God who's whispering, doesn't it? And after this, God repeats his question. What are you doing here, Elijah? One commentator says this. Elijah's answer is word for word the same as before in verse 10. Sometimes God is so close that we can feel him breathing on our neck. But we are so stuck in our disappointment, fear, and feelings that we don't hear him and we don't obey simple commands. Why did God not interrupt him and say, you already said that, you're repeating yourself. God is very patient in meeting us where we are and helping us find our way back to truth, healing, courage, and kingdom productivity. Now, there may be another reason why Elijah is so stuck. This is what the Bible scholar Charles Spurgeon has to say. Elijah perhaps thought that the dramatic display of power on Mount Carmel would turn the nation around. Or perhaps he thought that the radical display of God's judgment against the priest Baal of Baal would uh, follow the vindication that Mar- Mount Carmel would have changed the hearts of the nation. But neither of these worked. The people said, you are God, but he, he didn't have any assurance that it had worked. Uh, Charles Spurgeon goes on to say, because the success of Mount Carmel melted like the morning mist, he thought that his career had been a failure all along and that he had brought no one to reverencing Jehovah. But he was reading with the eyes of unbelief and his imagination was leading him rather than the facts of the case. Now, God gives a third chance to Elijah. God doesn't give up on Elijah. Instead, he gives him three new tasks to accomplish. It doesn't escape me, however, to see that Elijah's final task is to appoint his replacement, a young man named Elisha. One commentator says, God knows it's time to put things back in order in Elijah's mind. And it is time to put him back to serving. God didn't call him to another Mount Carmel experience. But God did also not discredit him from further service either. He reminds Elijah that he is still God. And he is still in control of his creation. In fact... There are 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal 
and whose mouths have not kissed him. So in conclusion, I want to remind you that no matter how you feel, God hasn't given up on us. He's not put off by our discouragement, fear, or even depression. I challenge you to speak to him and ask him to encourage you, even if it's in just a gentle whisper. So let's pray, shall we? Thank you, dear Lord, that you know how scary and discouraging life can be sometimes for us. But help us to remember that you walk beside us, each of us, every day. Thank you for your reminder to me these many months that you are not only in the boat with me, but you can calm any storm. I pray for each of us that we will hear your gentle whisper. Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you.